I was going to introduce myself, but he did it all for me, so now I don't have to talk about that. Let's dive into the passage here, Deuteronomy 6, uh, verse 1. Uh, but in order to get there, I want to establish some context. Now, this book is Moses' last address to the children of Israel. He is going to die very soon, and he needs to get these last words out and speak these last things to them. So this is an important, pertinent thing that he needs to say to them for them to grasp. And they're on the plains there of Moab. Is it? Okay. Am I? Should I stop? Should I grab one of those? We good now? Gucci. All right. Anyways, first time. Got to have something going. All right. Anyways, uh, they're on the plains there of Moab, and uh, they're about to enter into the land. And Moses is going to speak to them, and he's going to give them this surmising command that goes and just summarizes all of the law in one thing, one command there. And this command is called the Shema in Hebrew, which is from the first word which says here. But the main thing that I want you to grasp from this message is that God wants you to love and remember him. God wants you to love and remember him. In order to love and remember him, firstly, you must know that he is for you. You must know that he is for you. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1 reads, Now, these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that ye might do them in the land whither ye go to possess it. So Moses starts off here, these are the commandments. Uh, in Hebrew, it's actually singular, but the authorized version translators have put it in plural because they think it is referring to the entirety of the law. However, it could be referring to the later commandment in verse 4 that is going to summarize all of the law. But Moses is given this command, and he is to teach it to the people, and they are to then go and obey in the land that they are to possess. Verse 2, that thou might fear the Lord thy God, to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son, and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, that thy days may be prolonged. He starts off here, so that the people will fear. And that word fear there is not, not the idea of quaking constantly in anxiety over God, but a healthy reverence knowing that, yes, God is just, that he is powerful, and that if there is disobedience, there are consequences. But this fear is reverent. Moses wants the people to reverence God and to keep all his commands, all his statutes, and not only him, but his son and his son and then the son after them, they are to instill these commands, these ideas, so that every generation would continue to keep them. Generational training is essential in our world today. We have a secular society that wants our children, that wants to teach our children. And it is our job as the greatest spiritual assets of our children to instill in them God's word, God's teaching, so that they might go out and obey his commands. Verse 3 says, Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, the command, that it may be well with thee, that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee, in the land that floweth with milk and honey that it may be good for you. A good life is possible when covenant faithfulness with God is observed. When they obeyed God's word, they were blessed. There's this movie. Uh, it's really cheesy. It's called Flywheel. How many of you have seen it? Flywheel? Oh, good. Most of you haven't. All right. Anyway, so this movie is really cheesy. There's this there's used car salesman, and he's as crooked as they come. And he's always cheating people out of money because he, you know, he's a used car salesman. He sells them garbage cars for too much money. Uh, eventually he goes into debt though and God gets a hold of his heart and he submits to God and he says, you know what, Lord, this is now your car lot and my life is now yours. And he starts to treat people fairly and honestly. And when he should be losing money, he actually gains money. When he should go under, God blesses his obedience and the same thing is true today. If you obey God, you will be blessed. Not necessarily monetarily, though. I'm not going to preach a prosperity gospel this morning and tell you that if you obey God, you'll have money out the wazoo and you'll be rich but beyond your wildest dreams. That is not true. Jesus promises that they will hate you that hate me. 
And if you follow him, there will be people that don't like you in this world, but there are blessings beyond that are far greater than any money or land that this world possesses. And I submit to you that it is far greater to shoot for those rewards than anything here on this planet. How does this apply to us, though? Obey God that you may be blessed. Obey God that you may be blessed. Spiritual blessings will fall as you and God become closer through your obedience to him. And if you remain faithful, when you see him one day, he will say, well done. And you will receive great reward for following and obeying him. God wants you to love and remember him. God wants you to love and remember him. We just saw that you must know that he is for you, but now we need to know that you need to hear and to teach. You must hear and teach. We see this in verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. This begins the Shema. He says, hear. And the hearing here isn't just like a passive, like, oh, go one ear out the other, whatever, cool, you said something, Moses, I'm just not going to listen. No. The hear is one where you are intentionally listening in order to obey. He wants them to hear and obey what he has to say. And he says, Yahweh, or the Lord our God, is one Lord. Oh, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. There he starts off, Yahweh our God. No other nation could claim this. No other nation had been chosen, had been loved, had been saved, had had this special relationship with God like Israel had. No one could claim he's our God. Only Israel could. And then he goes on, he says, the Lord our God is one Lord. That word there, one Lord, is it's just one in Hebrew, one is a had, and Lord there is his name again, and it's in the predicate translation here. It's is one Lord, showing that he is one God, and that he is the one and only true God, and that he is the one God that Israel should serve, and that he is the one God that is supreme above all other gods. There is none like him. He has a singular selfhood not held by other gods. See, when they would enter Canaan, they would hear about all these other gods, And they would be in wood or stone, and they would be fickle. They would be angry one week, happy the other. Uh, They would have to do outlandish things, sometimes harming their body to please them. But that was not what this God was like. Our God is not like that. He is consistent. He is dependable. He is stable. You know why he's happy. You know why he's angry. He has prescribed to you exactly what he expects. He's not like those other gods. He is supreme. And there is none like him. Exodus 15, 11. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? I like how Peter, Peter Craigie puts it. When he spoke, there was no other to contradict. When he promised, there was no other to revoke that promise. When he warned, there was no other to provide refuge from that warning. He was not merely first among the gods as Baal in the Canaanite pantheon, Amon Re in Egypt, or Marduk in Babylon. He was the one and only God. As such, he was omnipotent. He was their one and only true God, the one that they were to seek to worship. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Verse 5, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Uh, Dr. Albert Moeller, president of Southern Seminary, uh, gave a presentation, well, a chapel message. He preached this message uh, on this chapter, and he spoke of how this is the central verb in the entire passage, and other commentators have said that this is the central verse in the entirety of the Old Testament as it summarizes. What does God want? Israel to do. He, above all else, what is he seeking from Israel? Is it outlandish obedience to do something crazy? Is it to listen? What is it? What does he want them to do? And thou shalt love the Lord thy God. Not mindless obedience, but heartfelt affection, love. That is what God wanted from his people. That's what God wants from us today. This is the first time in the entire Bible that man is commanded to love the Lord. And without love, true obedience is impossible. Israel had every reason to love God. He had 
He had saved them. He had heard them. He had ransomed them from Pharaoh. He had done all kinds of crazy things to secure them for himself. And he was about to give them a land. Israel had every reason to love God. And I think today we have every reason to love God as well. We despised him. We rejected him. We were his enemies. And yet he loved us first. He died in our place when we did not deserve it. Should we not love God as well for what he has done for us? So, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. All denoting the inclusive totality of each of these things. And the Bible is not necessarily a biology book, so we're not going to get every part of the body. But it says, with all thine heart. And the heart there uh, deals with the cognitive or the will, the the mental assent of somebody. So someone's thinking. So with your heart and then also with your soul, that is your being, your vital self. So the entirety of man is supposed to love God. But then he adds one other thing there. With all thy might, with all that one person is capable of doing, he is to love God. And we are to love God with everything that we are and everything that we have today. He has done so very much for us. How could we not? Verse 7, And thou shalt teach them diligently, the laws, unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Excuse me. Did I miss verse 6? Yeah. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Verse 6. Sorry, I skipped it. But yeah, so these words should be in thine heart, right? So how are they in their heart? It's, it's not just that they hear it once and they go about their day and do nothing with it. The Jewish people even today are very mindful of repetition of Scripture and of prayer. They, they are to always have in their mind who God is, how awesome, how supreme He is, and how they are to love Him. It's always supposed to be a part of them. And throughout their day, they are to repeat it. They are to say it. They are to remember who God is and that they are to love him. And as a result, it becomes a part of them. It is on their heart. And this, in turn, leads to the education of their children. In verse 7, as we just read, you should teach them diligently unto thy children. You shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Formal education was only for the elite in Israel at this time, those that could afford to buy, uh, not really buy, well, sometimes they were slaves, but teachers that they would pay for. And so as a result, most people had to train their children themselves and educate them. And the idea here is that constant education in who God is and loving him should be occurring throughout their daily lives. And we don't necessarily have our children with us all day, every day. Uh, that we send them to school, but then we get home with them. And we can instill God in them at that point. We can make sure and purpose in our hearts to bring God before them, to talk of his love and how we should love him. We can purpose in our hearts to be like the Israelites here, to always, in every situation, at all times, bring God into the picture. Everywhere and at all points of the day, the Shema should have been on the lips of the parents so that Their children were brought into sacred situations by the recitation and the remembrance of who God was. And not only that, the command was supposed to be seen. Verse 8, And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand. They shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. This has been taken literally by the Jewish people today, and it was literally taken during the second temple period. They started uh, making these things called phylacteries, which are leather strips. And at the end of the leather strip, they have a box that contains Deuteronomy 6, 4. And they took this literally, and they, they do this today. You can go to Israel, you can go to New York, wherever there is a large Jewish population that is Orthodox, they will stand there and they will chant the Shema and they will do this back and forth, trying to get it into their minds. Now, that's not the kind of repetition I believe God was looking for here. And it wasn't meant to be taken literally, I don't believe either, because God also talks about how the Passover should be on their arms and on their heads as frontlets. It's not necessarily that it should be visible physically, but that it should, when you look at another Jewish person, you should say, 
there is God's person and there is God's love. And when you look at another Jewish person, you should see God is working through them and God loves them. You should always be seeing God among his people. It should be present. The Jewish people also took literally the idea that you were supposed to write uh, the Shema on the post of your house and on your gates. They have these things called mezuzah. They put it on their doorposts. And you can always recognize a Jewish household by going and seeing that mezuzah with Shema on it, the Hebrew word. The idea isn't necessarily that you physically plaster God's word on your body. It's that You so love God and so emulate him that people know you love him and see that you love him in his covenant community. Everyone should know as you are teaching your children and as everyone else is teaching their children, they should know that God is the one God and that we are to love him. Application here. Lovingly remember your supreme Lord and teach your children about him. We need to lovingly remember our Supreme Lord and teach our children about him. Uh, There was a teacher I had in college. I don't remember her name, so I can't credit her for this illustration, but she she had a nephew, and her nephew was uh, very little at one point. He was uh, scared of this one slide at the park. He was very scared of it. And uh, he would uh, get on the slide, and before he would slide down, he would get there, and he'd almost do it, but then he would stop and say, I'm scared, I can't do it. And then he'd get up off the slide, and then he'd go, and he'd play, do something else. Well, one day in school, he learned that God protects you. God loves you, and he will keep you safe. And he learned the verse, what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. And so, later on, he went to that same slide, and his aunt remembers it distinctly. He gets to the top of it. He sits down, he says, what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. And so then he trusts God, and he slid down the slide. And the ant was very happy for him, like, yay, you did it, you slid down the slide. But the thing was, he repeated God's truth, and it became real to him. It was placed upon his heart. It wasn't just some verse distant in some book. It was something that applied to who he was. And he recognized that he didn't need to fear because God was with him. I submit to you today, lovingly remember your supreme Lord by repeating his word in your heart. Repetize, repetize, that's not a real word. Repeat God's scripture in your heart, in your head, and tell yourself about who he is so that he becomes more real to you. And also, teach your babies about God. i got a baby coming. I am so excited, and I'm going to teach him all about God. My mom, just yesterday, she gave me, we were at a baby shower in Georgia. She gave me my, my little baby Bible that I had, and now I'm going to read to him. I'm excited. But anyways, we should teach our children about this same God. We should instill in them the principles of the Shema, that God is the one true God, and that we should love him And we aren't with them constantly, like this verse implies, but we can practically have prayer time with our children. We can have small devotions at the end of the day, maybe once a week, maybe every day if you've got time. Sitting down and discussing scripture and just enveloping our children in God is so very necessary because there is a world that does not want them to love and fear God. There's a world that is inundating them through smartphones, through TV, through public education, that there is no God and that the only thing they should live for is the world. And we know that that will never satisfy and never make them whole and that the only thing worth living for is Christ. We've got to instill that in our children. We've got to disciple them, which leads me to my plug. Is it in the slides? Desserts and discipleship. We're going to be having this at church here. Uh, We're going to go through a book about discipling our children, and uh, if you would like to come, we would love to have you. We're going to have desserts at first, and then we're going to go through this book and just understand what discipleship is and how to better do it with our children. We're going to start doing this uh, quarterly, hopefully, Lord willing, and uh, better learn how to instill God's Word into our children. Shameless plug over. God wants you to love and remember Him. God wants you to love and remember Him. My final point is that you must never forget. You must never forget. Verse 10 says, And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, 
to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of all good things which thou fillest not, and wells digged which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not. When thou shalt have eaten and be full, then beware, lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt and from the house of bondage. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shalt swear by his name. He shall not go after other gods of the gods of the people which are round about you. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you. Lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. They weren't to go after other gods. Why is God so emphatic here? So strongly telling them that they are to remember him. Because sometimes when the going gets good, we forget God. Sometimes when everything's just right, comfort can blind. And we forget the whole reason why we are comfortable and why we are so blessed. And we forget to give praise to the one who gave us the comfort and the blessings. God says, don't go after those other gods. They were his covenant people They had been Pharaoh's slaves, and now they were under his covenant. They were his people, and they were to submit to him and him alone. They weren't to go after other gods. And God shows forth his zealous love here when he says, Beware, lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, and serve him, and shalt swear by his name. You shall not go after other gods, for the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you. And many people hear jealousy, and they think, that's bad. Why would God be jealous? God is zealous in his love for Israel. He loves them, loves them, loves them. And just as zealous as he is in his love, he is zealous in his discipline to get them back to him. He doesn't want them to stray. He doesn't want them to go after things that will never make them happy, that will not show forth to the world who he is and perform his glorious tasks. He wants them to be centered on him. He doesn't want them to go away. There is a warning there. Lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. There is extreme love had by God. And there are extreme consequences for forsaking him. Israel here is threatened with destruction because God loves them and he doesn't want them to leave. He wants them to stay in his covenant love. He wants them to be with him. So how does this apply? When the going gets good, purpose to never forget. When the going gets good, purpose to never forget. The amount of times in my life where I have just fallen on my face before God, because, like before this message and preaching right now, like I am so nervous. The amount of times I've done that, when I've gone through a bad situation and I've just fallen before Christ and said, I need you. Innumerable. The amount of times when I've had it really good and life's been going great and I've just gotten on my knees and I've said, thank you, God, for all that you've done, not as much. And I think that's the problem with most of us. We get so caught up in how good it is that we forget to thank the one who's made it good. When the going gets good, purpose to never forget your God. Verse 16, you shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massa. Uh, The temptation there would be, is the Lord among us or not? Or is he actually going to punish us? That's the idea of the temptation there. In verse 17, ye shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes which he hath commanded thee. And thou shalt do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord. Why? That it may be well with thee, that thou mayest go in and possess the good land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers. to Cast out all thine enemies from before thee as the Lord hath spoken. Remember God, keep his commandments. There is blessing for obedience. And then we come to the final section of the, of the passage here, which I love very much. Verse 20. And when thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, What mean the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments which the Lord our God hath commanded you? Then thou shalt say unto thy son, We were Pharaoh's bondmen in Egypt, And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. 
And the Lord showed signs and wonders, great and sore upon Egypt, upon Pharaoh, and upon all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from thence that he might bring us in to give us the land which he sware unto our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes to fear the Lord our God for our good always. And he might preserve us alive as it is to this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. The Israelites were to be so inundated with God, have him so present in their lives. They were always to be keeping the law, always to be following after what God wanted them to do so that their kids would look at them and say, Dad, why do we do this? Why do we follow this? And then immediately thereafter, Dad would say, because God saved us. Because God is so good to us. He brought us here. He kept his promises. He did exactly what he said he was going to do. How can we not obey him? How can we not keep what he has asked us to keep, son? That's why we follow God. My dad used to tuck me in at night when I was four and six years old. He doesn't do it anymore, thankfully. But he used to tuck me in. And there were times at night when I would have just outlandishly strange questions and I would ask him weird things. But then there were times when my dad would sit with me and I'd have questions about God. And he wouldn't sit there and be like, no, 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 go to bed, Hamish. It's late. You don't need to hear about this now. We can talk about this later. Now he sat there with me and he told me how good God was. Share God's salvific love with your children. Don't just put it off if they ask outlandishly weird questions. Sit there and tell them about what God has done for you. And what God had done for the nation of Israel was amazing. And they were to tell their children about that amazing love and that amazing salvation. God has saved you in an amazing fashion, church. You were separated from him And he did not have to bridge that gap and love you, yet he did it anyways. How could you not share that great love with those that you love? Tell your children about God. Share with them your testimony of how it has shaped you and how he has saved you. God wants you to love and to remember him. He wants you to love and remember him. He doesn't want things to get too good. He doesn't want you to go after other gods or other things in the secular world. He wants you to remember to love him and to instill that love in your babies. There's a world out there that wants them so badly. But we have a chance to instill in them God's love. Will you remember and love God and instill that in your children?